Hello and welcome to this tutorial prior to the IPSS Summer School. In this video, I'll give you a short introduction into how to get started with programming and how to get started with Julia in particular. The idea is that you make yourself familiar with Julia and with the libraries that uh, we're using AgentsJL so that you can have a basic model that you can use during the summer school at the beginning of the summer school. If you're familiar with either programming in Julia or programming in general, this video might be kind of boring for you, so feel free to skip ahead and um, see what, what material is necessary for you. Don't worry if, if you feel like you're skipping too much, we'll also upload the slides to, to the website so that you, are, uh, that you can make sure that you've seen everything. So this is a very basic tutorial. It gives a basic introduction into how programming works for everyone who has not programmed before. Um, and it, at the same time, it provides a course for Julia. The first thing that you need to do is setting up your computer. You have to install Julia and your IDE, and we have a specific video for that that is not part of this video, but we will provide the link um, next to this video so you will find uh, the video and you will be able to install your computer. But before you even get started with programming, let's give a short introduction into what programming in general means. So what are the basics of programming? Um, the first thing that we need to understand is how programming works. In the, the most basic sense, we have to find a way of getting what we want in a format that the computer understands it and um, translate that into something that the machine can execute. And to this we call either an interpreter or a compiler. And these are two different ways of how programming can work. And we'll have a short look at where the differences are. So the idea behind both of these is that it converts our human readable program to a machine readable program. Because obviously we know that computers, they work with electricity and zeros and ones and all that. And underneath the hood, there's a lot of uh, translation going on. On the very basic idea uh, or a basic level, programs are lists of instructions. And for example, in this case, add the numbers one and three and store the results in a variable called x. And every instruction is executed before the next line is executed. So lines of code are executed one after another. There are ways to do things in parallel, and we'll have a look at that later. But in general, everything is linearly executed one after another. So in a program, what is at the top of the program is executed first, and what is at the bottom of the program is executed last. Obviously, not every program is just a linear list of things to do, so we have special keywords that allow us to create loops inside of this code and have branches that go into different directions to control the program flow. And this allows us to make all these intricate programs, such as PowerPoint, which I'm using right now, or Camtasia to do the recording here. They are basically just sets of instructions, branches, and loops, and stuff like that. So let's give a short example of how this will look in Julia. We can create something that is called a variable, which is a data store for us, where we can store information. So if we add 1 and 3 together and store that in X, if we then later type in the x value, we will see that we get the result of 4. Obviously, we can use these variables in other commands. So in this case, we're defining a variable y or creating a variable y that uses the variable x and adds something to that. And then we have the value of 5. Obviously, these things just are operations in the machine and they just do something in the background and you're not aware of the result unless you actually print the result in some way. And for this, we have the, for example, the print command. And the example that this uh, serves here for is calling a function because printing, obvious, uh, it's not as obvious, but uh, under the hood requires a lot of things to do. It, it requires that individual pixels are changed on the monitor and it, it requires the, the console to where we print, which is basically like, it looks like a text editor. Um, it requires that to change the state, that it moves up a line, and oh, there's a lot of things going on in the background. And we <coughs> we can combine all of this information in a function call. So print, we don't know how print does something, we just know that it does something. And it does this with what is given as a parameter. So in this 
um, in these parentheses, we're giving the y variable here. So the idea is let print the 5. Where and how that's, uh, in this case, magic to us, and we don't need to know, we just call the function and use it. Obviously not all functions are magic to us and uh, un are not understandable for us. Some of them we can define ourselves, as we do here in the next three lines. We define a function called sq, or short for square, that will take a variable x and it will return x times x, so the function returns the result of x squared. And end demarks the end of this function, so the function knows that it should do everything between uh, the function line and the end line when the function is called. Um, in this case, this function only works if x is a number. So we also have variables that do not store numbers, but that store characters, for example. In this case, this function would not work. Um, functions can also be chained together. So we can square the number y, which would be 5, and 5 squared is 25, and then print that. So we would print the square of y, and functions in this case can be chained into one another to make use of the results in another function. These are very basic instructions. Obviously, there's a lot more, but this is just to give you a short understanding of what is possible. Um, we also want to control the program flow. We want to decide whether something should go this way or another way. And for this, um, we can, if for example, we set a variable x to the value of 4, we can then test if this x variable is larger than 3, which it is, then do something. And if that is not the case, do something else. So this line tests if the variable is larger than 3, the larger sign and 3, and if this expression is evaluated to true, which is in this case the case, then the line directly underneath is executed. So print sqx. So we print the square of the x value. Uh, we can also have multiple lines executed after this x. And that for that case, we have an end option to end the block that is executed. But we can also say we should do something else if that x value is not larger than 3. And for this, we have the else um, keyword. So if we use if, else, end, then we have something between the if and else statement that is executed if this expression here is true. And if that expression is not true, and we would say that it's false, we would then evaluate the statement down here. So in this case, this whole block here would print the square numbers 16, 25, and so on. And for all values 3 and lower, we would print the number itself. An important thing to keep in mind is x larger than 3 means x has to be 3 point something to be larger than 3. If it is 3, then this is not correct. This is truly larger than 3. There is also an option to test if something is larger or equal than 3, which we will see in the actual coding example later. Another thing that is tremendously helpful in programming are something called for statements. There's different ways of doing these things. What we want to do here is we want to do something multiple times. So in this case, we want to print the numbers 1 to 10. And what we do is we iterate over the variable i. We often use i as the variable for iteration because of iterate. So for i in 1 to 10, print line i end. So what it does is iterate the variable i over all elements in this, what we see here is 1 colon 10. And for every possible i, print that i and add a new line. So the, there are two new things here. The print line is an interesting thing. We, we, back then we used print, and now we use print line. And what print line does, it creates a new line in the console. That is not done automatically, so if, you, if I were to print this, Without the print line, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in a row, and now it's um, all of them in a column. So the 1 to 10 is something that you haven't seen before. It's something that Julia does. It automatically creates an array, what that is we'll see in the next slide, that contains multiple values, namely the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And that is an easy way to do something 10 times for, for i and 1 to 10 do something. It doesn't even have to look at the i value. If you just want to do something 10 times, we can ignore the, the iterator variable itself and then end. And 
We can also do this with other types of arrays. This doesn't have to be numbers, this can be arrays of characters, then we would print out all the individual characters, but we don't know how to create them yet. Which brings us to arrays. So what are arrays? Arrays are a typical data type that we see in programming languages that are kind of like a collection of values. We have multiple values. For example, here we initialize the variable x that gets the array 1, 2, 5, and what it does, it creates an array variable with three values, 1, 2, and 4. Sorry, I said 5, I think, a second ago. And this is what we would then call a one-dimensional array. In Julia, because Julia is very close to math, we would call these vectors, like in matrix, uh, one-dimensional matrices are sometimes called vectors. And we can access the individual elements by typing x and then brackets and the index that we want to access. Importantly, in Julia, the first item is indexed by one, this is, by, is indexed by two, and this is indexed by three. So accessing the third element of the array stored in x is achieved by calling x brackets 3. Many other languages start with 0, so it would be 0, 1, and 2, but Julia starts with 1, and that is something to keep in mind because that's um, how it would be done in math as well. Mathematics indexes starts indexing with 1 and not with 0, and that's why this is done this way in Julia. What is why would we say something is an array? Why don't we say it's a collection of some sort? Because we have different types of collection data structures. Most commonly we use arrays, but arrays have a requirement. It requires that every element is of the same data type. So in this case, ones or twos or threes, which would be numbers, but we could also have names in there like uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Also, arrays are variable in length. We can add to this x array here by calling the push exclamation point function. And the first parameter or argument we sometimes say is the array that we want to push something into, and then the element that is pushed into this array. And this will basically return an array that has one, two, three, and four in them. A different type of data structure that can be kind of like a collection are tuples. And tuples are denoted writing parentheses and um, commas in between the values. And these can be different data types. The, in this case, it's 1, 2, and 3, but we could also have 1, 2, and Charlie, and that would be a legal tuple in the Julia language. Um, tuples, on the other hand, we cannot push into them. They are fixed when, once they're created, and these are tremendously helpful in some some cases, but they are fixed and they're not created in a way that they can grow or shrink. For example, the, the array can also shrink. We can delete items from an array, which we will see also in the actual programming example. We have a third uh, data structure, which is the so-called matrix. If we drop the commas in the, and still use the brackets, then we get a matrix, in this case a 1 by 3 matrix, uh, which we can use in linear algebra. and uh, these can only, I think they can only be done with um, numerical values, um, but I'm not 100% sure. I think Julia is kind of flexible, so it could be that we could define algebra on, on characters and it would work on them as well, so um, it's something to try out later. This is a very broad overview of what programming is, and if you're unsure of what to do, the documentation in Julia is really superb. You can basically go to this URL, docs.julialang.org, the English documentation version 1, because we're on version 1 in Julia, 1.9 to be precise, and in the top left corner there's a search. You can search the documentation, and if you look into the menu you will see there's a getting, starting, a getting started option and many other options to get help. The explanations are long, but they are very helpful and if you're, if you're in trouble, it makes complete sense to have a look at the getting started thing. And there you will see there's a lot more detail to what I just um, quickly showed to you because there's more, do more data types and there's uh, actually some implications of the data types. We'll see some of them in the program example after this video. Okay, before we dive into the actual programming exercises, I'll go back into the differences that we mentioned in the beginning between 
the two options that we have that translate human readable code into machine readable code. We have on the one hand side languages that use interpreters or so-called interpreted languages such as Python or R and they typically come with something that is called a read eval print loop or REPL or REPL. The idea here is that you can enter a command or a um, instruction into the REPL and you will immediately get the result and that is really helpful in trying to learn a language. The problem with interpret languages is that typically errors only happen at the moment of interpretation so it can happen that your program runs well but the user at a certain point in time when he uses your program he runs into this one branch of program that you never executed and then you get a runtime error. Also interpreted languages have slower execution times than so-called compiled languages because the, the way that these programs work is basically they load the machine, the human readable instructions into memory and then translate them line by line um, while the program is running. On the other hand, compilers or compilation based languages such as C++, Rust or Java they work the other way around. The idea is you write your code and when you think everything is perfect you run a so-called compiler that tests the code for errors and generates the machine readable code and then you can run the machine readable code um, directly and it is there is no more translation effort afterwards. The downside of this is you have to um, finish your code, you cannot test changes in lines very quickly, you have to go through the whole step of compilation and the benefit is that most errors happen during compile time so you do not get these runtime errors that are unpredictable or kind of unpredictable in interpreter languages. Another benefit is that you get faster execution times because there is no more overhead for translating your code while it is running. And Julia tries to use best of both worlds. It uses what we call so, what it's so-called just-in-time compilation. Actually other languages do that as well. There are um, extensions for Python. Oh, Python is uh, spelled incorrectly here. Uh, Java uses just-in-time compilation. Julia is the example that we're using here. And it does things in a way of trying to compile things while it is running the interpreter and thus trying to reap the execution benefits while at the same time you're able to run individual lines of code without having to compile the whole program. The downside of that is that it has some warm-up time so it does some compilation at the beginning of your program and then it gets faster the, the longer the program runs. And for many instances this is really helpful because you you worry about execution time typically when your program runs for a very long time not when it runs for a very short time because then obviously you're not worried about runtime. So the warm-up time is a one-time cost in the beginning and afterwards your program should run fine. So Julia uses a mix of pre-compilation, just-in-time compilation and interpretation and pre-compilation is something that you're going to see whenever you're running a new library. That library is pre-compiled, so before you can actually enter any code, it compiles the library for your specific machine. And Julia um, does that by compiling to the LLVM. It used to be called Low Level Virtual Machine, but now it's just LLVM, which is a um, virtual computer inside of your computer that, that is very... Com there are many um, translators from that virtual computer to all kinds of different real hardware. So it, ha it provides a lot of machine specific optimizations and it can generate very fast machine code. And, but Julia is not the only language that uses LLVM. There's more than that, that use LLVM. Um, so that is not a sole benefit of Julia, but what it means is the code that Julia generates is very fast. Let's get into an example um, that we want to write as, a, as our first Julia program. And it's an example from our childhood, at least from uh, the German childhood, and that is playing the so-called Trumpf Quartet. And you've probably never heard of this, I don't know if this has been a phenomenon outside of Germany, but it's a game um, that we play as children, and you might wonder why should we do a game? Why are um, computer scientists always so obsessed with games? 
And the benefit of games are that they have, normally, they have a defined set of rules, which is ideal because we can use them as programmatic descriptions. Um, anything that is in the real world where we don't have these clearly defined rules, so for example, if we want to do machine learning or um, recognizing images or something like that, there's not, there's not a, a, a predefined set of rules. And all knowledge about the game is available. There is nothing unknown to the programmer when we're developing a game. Um, and games, like the one that we're using now, require the basic building blocks of programming. Um, and these are the things that we want to learn. So we have to keep track of the score. Where, that's where we need variables. We have a game loop that iterates over time. And so we need um, program flow structures. And we have to do branching according to how the game progresses, who's winning or who's losing. And these are the basic command structures that we want to learn. And that is why using a simple game as a starting point is a, um, it's a very nice um, set of uh, conditions that help us create our first program. So what about this Trumpf Quartet that I mentioned? Trumpf Quartet was a game that we played uh, back in the 80s and early 90s and it was uh, a card game basically. You bought these card games, uh, they were mostly 32 cards, in this case there were 34 cards um, with two special cards. And the idea is that every card is basically a car, if it's about cars or it's about animals or airplanes. And you have, on every card you have attributes. So in this case, uh, the amount of cylinders, the, the amount of power output that this car has, the rounds per minute of the engine, the top speed and the price in Deutschmarks, which is the f former currency in Germany. So this is an old card game. And the idea is that the outer game loop works like this. You split the stack of these 34 cards between the two players, so everyone gets 70s, uh, 17 cards, and you shuffle the cards, and then you draw from the top of your, of your stack, and you pit the cards against each other while not seeing the card of the other person. And you have to kind of pick one of your attributes um, to fight against the other card, and whoever wins, who takes... That person takes the, the other person's card, puts it into their stack, and this, the, this game loop repeats until one player is out of cards. And the most basic idea of the inner game loop is, so when, for example, these two cards, this one is what player one draws, and this is what player two draws, player one, if, if it's player's one turn, they have to decide, okay, what do I pick? Um, what attribute do I pick? where I assume that I am better than my opponent, but you don't know the card of your opponent. So in this case, um, it also depends on how the individual attribute is evaluated. For example, the... Um, uh, ah, who problem? How does that translate? That's the engine size, so to say, in cubic centimeters. Uh, that would probably... Larger is better. Cylinders, probably a larger is better. Power output probably larger is better. Um, rounds per minute is probably larger, better. Top speed larger is better. And price probably larger is better. So this is an a example of a Trumpf Quartet where every attribute, if you have the larger value, you're going to win this inner, this, this instance. But some of the games, you have something like um, CO2 output, and then lower is better, and oftentimes the... The, the smaller car has the lower CO2 footprint. Uh, and so that the, 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 the intelligence in playing the games, understanding where all other cars are and where your card is. So good players know the values of all the other cars and can try to predict what is their best attribute to compete against uh, a random different card that the other player might have. And so the game loop is very simple. It's not a very complicated game. And that's ideal for a programming exercise. So what we'll do next is we'll try to implement this game as a Julia game. And the idea is that you try to follow along. So please set up your development environment as we've shown in the other video that you're going to see. And then while I am coding, try to hit pause uh, every once in a while and try to do the same thing on your computer to get it running. And the idea in this video is that I will try to um, develop this from the ground up. 
and you will see that a lot of programming is trying to figure out where is the problem coming from, that where did I do something wrong, where do I look up the documentation, and how do I improve what I've been doing according to what I find online, and that includes websites such as Stack Overflow or the Julia documentation. And even if you struggle keeping up with um, following the instructions, uh, try to just type in the words and maybe there's something that I'm using that I, that I might explain a moment later, but I hope that uh, by building this from the ground up that I'll introduce every command and every, um, every keyword that I'll be using while um, developing the program. So if you're ready, if you feel um, ready, please set up your development environment and start with the next video.